<laughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. You guys want to let us in on what's so exciting? Just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we're almost there. Um, today uh, we're going to be talking about cash coherence. We're basically going to continue on the theme that we started last time, which is talking about um, issues that come up when you are actually uh, have multiple processors that are trying to execute something in parallel. And so last time we focused on the synchronization problems and how do we deal with um, things like uh, precedence constraints, uh, limited resources, as well as uh, critical sections which need to not be interrupted. Today we're actually going to look at what happens when you have multiple caches operating in parallel potentially on uh, shared data and how do we deal with that. So before we get started with that, just a couple final reminders. Um, so everything is due tomorrow. Um, I t expect today's lecture to actually go a little short, so hopefully that'll give you a few extra minutes to go and work on your design project if you want. And um, as far as uh, what's left for the course, um, tomorrow's recitation is going to cover cash coherence problems, which is material that's uh, going to be covered on our third quiz. Um, next week, however, uh, the last lecture and the last recitation are optional. Um, I am told that the last lecture is going to be really fun, so you should come. Um, and the last recitation is basically going to be a, uh, we didn't want to start going through the practice quizzes just because it's a little too soon before our quiz. So we're going to hold an evening quiz review session um, a few days before the quiz. And what we'll use the Wednesday recitation for is just open questions on any topic uh, that you might think that you need help with. Um, what else? Oh yeah, and don't forget also uh, to fill out um, uh, to feedback on 6004. Okay, any questions before we get started? All right, terrific. <clears throat> so, we talked last time about, so you can either have um, multiple processors or multiple cores uh, that are part of the same CPU. In this picture here, what we see is multiple cores, each of which has its own private cache, and then we have a shared memory that's shared across them all. So, as far as your um, programs are concerned, we already saw, you know, last time that, you know, dealing with synchronization is difficult enough when you're having multiple things running at the same time. Now, you can only imagine that if, on top of that, the processor had to, each process had to keep track of what was in each one of the private caches in order to make sure that it did the right thing, that would be nearly impossible. So, what we want is for these private caches to affect effectively appear um, to be invisible uh, to the programmer. So as far as you know, uh, the programmer is concerned, we want them to think that there is this one large shared memory and uh, that everything should be consistent across it. And so today we're going to see what are the issues and how do we deal with um, that consistency. So first let's take a look at you know, what is the actual problem if we don't do anything. So imagine that I have you know, here core zero which wants to do a load operation from address A. Okay, So it issues a load operation to address A, main memory responds and it says the value at address A is 2. And so now it caches that value um, in, its, uh, in its cache with some tag information associated with address A. And if it gets a future request for address A, it can respond from the cache. Now, core 2 comes along, and it too wants to do something with address A. It's going to do a store to address A, okay? And specifically, it's going to store the value 3 into address A. And so, it too is going to bring address A into its cache, but now it's going to update it to 3. And now, when we go back to, you know, core 0, which thinks it actually already has address A in its cache, and it goes to do another load, what it's going to do is it's going to read value 2, which is the stale value because it should read the updated value that was written by core 3, which is 3. I mean core 2, which is 3. Okay? So we have to figure out how do we deal with avoiding this stale data. 
So the way that we do that is we use what's called the cache coherence protocol. And so cache coherence protocols are basically going to ensure that we don't have um, stale lines. And the most common way of doing this is through, uh, and we'll get to more details of this in a second, but what we call invalidate mechanisms. And so um, what would happen is before you allow a write to any particular address, you first have to invalidate the uh, uh, caches that also hold that address. So you would first invalidate cache zero, um, copy of address A, then you would be able to write to uh, core two's um, address A, and you wouldn't have a problem when uh, core zero goes back to reading it because now it would actually try to go and fetch it from main memory because it's no longer in its cache. All right, so a few things that we have to make sure of in order to um, handle cache coherence. So the first, uh, first of all, we have to enforce two rules. The first is write propagation. And what write propagation says is that when I do a write, eventually that write has to become visible to all of the processors, okay? And the second thing that we have to ensure is write serialization. And what this means is that if I'm doing multiple writes to the same address, then all of the processors have to see those writes in exactly the same order, okay? So how do we go about um, ensuring these two things? So first of all, for write propagation, we have two mechanisms, the more common one being the first, which is what we just mentioned, which is write invalidate protocols. So what this means is that when somebody wants to do a write, the first thing that you do is you invalidate the copy of that same address from all of the other caches, and then uh, the processor has its own copy um, of that address, and so it's now able to do the write. I, um, an alternative to this is what's called a write update protocol. And so in this case, instead of invalidating their cache, the cache that performed the most recent write would have to also make sure that um, it propagates its information so that the other caches can then update uh, their caches to the most recent value as well. But we're going to be focusing on the first, which is write invalidate, which is a lot simpler to implement. Then in order to um, ensure write serialization, we use um, one of two protocols. The more basic one is called uh, Snoopy-based protocol, and we're going to spend most of today's lecture on that. Um, but a more efficient and more scalable one is a directory-based protocol, which we'll just touch upon um, at the end of today's lecture. All right, so let's start with Snoopy caches. So how do Snoopy caches work? So the idea is that I have these multiple processes running in parallel, and each one of them has their own private cache. And we call this, the, it's, it's actually a Snoopy cache. And the caches are all connected through a shared bus. Okay, and then from there they can also connect to main memory. Now, in the past, when we dealt with our caches, the processor was the one making requests of either loads or stores, and the cache was responding. If it had the value, then it would you know, have a hit and return the data. If it had a miss, it would then go to main memory and fetch the data from there. In this case, things get a little bit more complicated because the caches now actually have to listen to, to two sources. They have to listen to the requests coming from the processors, but they also have to listen to what's going on in the bus. Okay, and they need to respond um, uh, accordingly for based on, on on both of those. So. <clears throat> How do we uh, go about doing this? So the first thing is we have to make sure that um, all of our uh, memory requests and our broadcasts on this bus are in order so that everybody sees all loads and all stores in exactly the same order. And then what happens is that each cache controller is going to snoop, which is where they get their name from, um, on the bus in order to see what's going on on the bus, not only for its own transactions, but also for what everybody else is doing. And based on whatever what else whatever is going on the bus, it's going to potentially change the state of its cache line. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to implement a finite state machine which defines what exactly uh, each cache line needs to do depending on its current state and what's going on in either um, the processor request or the shared bus.
All right, so we're going to start off with a pretty simple protocol. Um, this is just valid invalid. So just like um, uh, in our original implementation of caches, we had a concept of having a valid bit, where the valid bit told you whether you know the cache line that you have is valid or whether you know you just started up or something and, and it might be garbage that's in there. In, um, in cache coherence, we want to use the valid bit uh, to indicate a little bit more. And so the way that, the, that we're going to use the valid and valid bit for cache coherence is as follows. It's going to follow this FSM that's described here, where we have two states, invalid and in, invalid. So you start off in the invalid state, and suppose that the processor um, issues a read request or a load. Okay, so if it issues a read request, then I'm going to fetch something from main memory. The way that I do that is by initiating a bus read request. And so the bus read is going to go talk to main memory. It's going to get the data that it's requesting from main memory and bring it into the cache. And when I bring it into the cache, my state is now valid. And so I've moved to this valid state over here. Okay. Once I'm in the valid state, that means I've brought the value from memory. And so if I now get another read request, I can just respond directly from my cache. And so that's what this uh, feedback arrow here represents, where it says if we get another read request, then we don't have to initiate any additional um, bus transactions. We can just respond from our cache. However, if we get a write request, then we have to initiate what's called a bus write transaction. So the idea is that in this implementation, the caches that we're using are write through caches. Can anybody tell me if they remember what a write through cache is? Yep? If you're writing to an address in the cache, um, then it will also propagate upwards to the next memory. Correct. So you're always writing back to memory as well. Okay. So basically what's happening here is even when I have a valid, um, uh, I'm in the valid state, if I'm doing a write, I am going to actually initi initiate a bus write so that my write is also written to main memory. Okay. Now, what does this dashed line here mean? This means suppose that I'm another cache and I'm seeing on the bus a bus write request initiated by somebody else. What, you know, what do I need to do? And so if I was in the valid state and someone else is trying to now write to a particular location that I also have in my cache, I need to now pay attention to this bus write um, uh, action and become invalid so that the only um, uh, cache that has a valid copy of that particular address is the one that's actually doing the writing. Any questions about that? Great. Um, and then finally, um, in, in this particular protocol, because it's a write through, if we're in the invalid state and we're trying to, uh, we get a process write request, then we simply write directly to memory and we stay in the invalid state. And so we initiate this uh, bus write action, which writes directly to memory. Okay? So, so far, not too complicated. So let's work through a simple example just to make sure that um, you know, all these transactions uh, make sense. So imagine a situation where we just have two cores, core 0 and core 1. Each one of them has their own private cache, and we have this shared main memory. So imagine now that core 0 starts off by doing a load of address A. So what is that going to do based on our FSM? That's going to initiate a bus read request for address A. And the memory sees that bus read request and it's going to respond with what is an address A. And so that response is going to come back to the a cache of core 0 and it's going to change its state to the valid state and it's going to uh, say that for you know, the tag associated with address A, the value is 2. Okay. So now we proceed, and now core 1 also wants to load address A. So in this case, once again, it's going to initiate a bus read request, and it too is going to get a response, and so it's going to change its state to um, valid and also update its cache to 2. 
Now, if I get any further read requests from either Core 0 or Core 1, I no longer need to initiate any more bus transactions because I now have it in my cache and I have a valid copy in my cache. So any further responses can come directly from the cache. <clears throat> but now, suppose that um, the next thing that happens is that Core 0 wants to execute a store to address A. Okay? We said that only, you know, when I execute a store, we need the other caches to invalidate their copies, okay? So the way this, this is going to happen is that the store is going to um, initiate a bus write action on our bus, and that's going to take this value 3, which we're trying to write into address A, and update main memory with it. But in addition, it's going to go to core 1 and have core 1 invalidate its entry for address A in the cache. Okay? Now, once it invalidates its entry, then the, or, and all, if you had more cores and then all of them invalidated their entries, then now core 0 is the only one that actually has a copy of address A um, that's valid in its cache. And so now it's able to go ahead and update it uh, to three and everything will continue to be consistent across the entire system. So now if you know core one now does another load of A because its value was made invalid, it's going to issue another bus read and it's going to get you know, a response that says, okay, now the new value of address A is three. Okay? Yes? Um, if you're invalid and you have a right, why do you remain invalid? Because it's a write through cache, and so you're always writing to memory anyway, so there's no particular need to bring it into your cache. I mean, if you were going to then use it for anything else, you could also do uh, another read, which would then bring the updated value into the cache. So if you, if you write, um, you don't update your cache, you only update your memory? In the, you, don't, you could. I mean, in a write through cache, you could do, you could do it both ways. Okay, so who sees some problems with this VI simple protocol? Is it great? Should we stop here and go home or can we do a little better? Yeah. If, you, if you're using like N caches, you need to like update across all N of them, which takes time. Well, um, we're, it, it, true, but it's not, we're not actually updating, we're invalidating, which is a little bit faster than actually updating. But the key to, to notice here is that every time we're doing a write, what has to happen? I need to update main memory and I need to initiate a bus transaction, okay? So regardless of whether I'm um, uh, whether I have you know the data in my cache or not, I'm always writing back to main memory, which is costly because I don't have to necessarily write every single one of those values back. And in addition, every single write requires a broadcast on this bus, which is an expensive operation. Okay, so we want to try to improve on that. So before we get to our next protocol, let's. Um, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what do we need to be true in order for our cache coherence to work properly? So we said that all of the loads and stores that are seen in our entire system have to have a global ordering, meaning that everybody sees them in exactly the same order. Now, if we're not careful and multiple caches have copies of the same address, then you can imagine, you know, getting yourself into trouble where that's not actually what's happening. So, in order to ensure that we do have this global ordering, we can do the following. The first is that we only allow one cache at a time to have write permission to an address. So just like we saw in the simple valid invalid, uh, valid invalid protocol, when one of the caches wanted to write to the location, the other one, if it had a, a valid copy of it, had to become invalid. Okay, and the second thing is that at no point will any cache have a stale copy of the data, right? So it's already going to go to the invalid mode, and so it will no longer, you know, consider the old value to uh, to be the correct answer. 
All right, so we're going to introduce now a new protocol, which is a slightly uh, modified version of the valid invalid. And this is called MSI, which stands for Modified uh, Shared Invalid. And um, so the invalid state basically means the same thing, which is you don't have a copy of that address in your uh, cache. The shared um, uh, bit or the shared state indicates that um, your cache has a particular address in it, but you are only allowed to execute reads to it because some other caches may have that address as well. And finally, the modified state means that only this cache has the address, and so it's safe to do both reads and writes if you're in the modified state. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at what the FSM for um, this MSI protocol looks like. And first of all, let's remind ourselves what we said the drawbacks or the VI uh, mechanism were. So the drawback was that every update also wrote to main memory, and every update caused a, a broadcast on our bus. So MSI is going to solve both of those issues. So first of all, it's going to allow for us to have uh, write back caches. It doesn't have to be a write through cache. And some of our, um, uh, of our writes are going to be able to be satisfied locally without having to initiate any bus transactions. So let's take a look at this. Now, the state diagram might look a little more scary, so let's go through um, what this is telling us. Okay, so first of all, we have our three states, M, S, and I. The ones at the bottom means we essentially have uh, fewer permissions, and as we move up in the states, we have more permissions. So the modify is a state that gives us the most permissions, which allows us to actually um, write to a particular location. Um, on the left here, what we show here in orange arrows are the processor-initiated requests, okay? And so the processor-initiated requests can cause some uh, bus transactions, which is what's shown after this slash. Um, but all this side of our, um, of our FSM is initiated by a processor request. Now, you'll notice that when we um, have processor requests, what's basically happening is that the processor is getting us to have more permission for a particular location. And so what's happening is that we're moving up in this FSM from you know, a lower state to a higher state. Okay. On the right-hand side, with these dashed blue lines, we see bus-initiated transactions. Okay, so this means when, you know, some other cache uh, did responded to some processor request, and as a result, it put some, um, uh, broadcast something onto the bus, then all the other caches that are seeing that information on the bus need to respond accordingly. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a closer look at, you know, what actually is happening. So we'll start off, you know, in the invalid state, and let's say that I want to read something, right? So um, my processor issues a processor read, and that's going to cause a bus read um, request in order to tell um, everybody else that I'm reading this particular location. And now I moved into the uh, shared state, so. Um, I'm able to now read it, but not modify it uh, when I'm in the shared state, okay? If instead of just doing a read, I wanted to actually do a write, then I'm going to go all the way up to the modified state, but in order to do that, I have to, you know, give a stronger statement on my bus, which is called uh, bus read exclusive, okay? So this is basically saying I want to get an exclusive copy of this location into my cache. So what happens if one cache issues a bus read exclusive? Then all the other caches which are listening, whether they're in the shared state or the memory state, if they see a bus read exclusive, they're going to bring themselves back into the invalidate state. And so we see that here along this arrow from modified um, to invalid, as well as here from shared to invalid. Okay? All right. So now imagine that I made it to the modified state. 
So that means that I'm the only cache that has a copy of this address. And so I'm free to do what I want with it. So I can read to it, I can write to it. And you'll see that both the reads and the writes in this case um, don't require any bus transactions. Okay, so this is where MSI is better than the VI protocol because I'm, try I'm now saving on uh, bus transactions which are costly. And, um, and finally, there's you know a few more states like if you're in a shared state and then you want to write, then you would do a similar thing like what you did from invalidate, which is um, issue a processor write, which causes a bus read exclusive. That takes you to the modified state, but it would make any other cache that has that address invalidate itself. Okay, so let's work through an example. Um, just to make sure it all makes sense. So we're going to follow the same example uh, pretty much that we had before, where we have um, two cores. Each of them has their own private cache, and we have this shared memory. And we start off with core 0 wanting to do a load of address A. Okay, So the first thing that happens is we issue a, read, a bus read request of address A. And the main memory is going to respond. And so now we put ourselves into the shared state with the value of address A, which is 2. Okay? Now, core 1 comes along, and it also wants to load address A. So it's going to initiate another bus read request. And once again, the memory is going to see that. It's going to respond. And it, too, is going to move into the shared state with a value of 2 for address A. All right, so once both of these cores have loaded the value of A, just like in the VI uh, protocol, they're now able to respond uh, to loads um, uh, directly from the cache. They don't need to initiate further bus reads, OK? But let's take a look what happens when we do stores. OK, so now core 0 wants to do a store to address A. Right? So in order to do a store, we're going to have to make an exclusive read request. Okay? So we initiate this bus read exclusive for address A. And what does that do? Well, um, that's going to basically tell core 1 that it needs to invalidate its location um, for address A. And once it invalidates it, then core 0 can move to the modified state and go ahead and update that location. Now you'll notice that at this point we've updated the location in the cache. We have not updated main memory because this is a write back cache, not a write through cache. Okay, and so now, you know, if core 0 gets either loads or stores, it's able to handle both of them locally from its own cache, okay? But now, suppose that um, core uh, 1 comes along, and it too wants to do a store to address A. So now what do we have to do? Anybody? Zero. Yeah. So we're going to reissue a bus read exclusive. The core zero is going to see this bus read exclusive, and it's going to invalidate itself. Um, but before invalidating itself, because it was in the modified state in this case, it is initiating a bus write back. Okay. So this write back is now taking the value that was modified in cache, the cache of core 0 and writing it back to memory. Okay, So that memory is going to have this updated value of 3 uh, written back to it. Once that happens, then core 0 becomes invalid. And now core 1 is able to go ahead and modify um, its value. And so it moves to the modified state and it updates its local copy of the cache to the new updated value um, for A. Yes? What's the point of doing the write back? Is there's no overwrite in, the, in core 1 with the new value? Um, well, if you, uh, so if you were doing a load, you would have to do a write back. So the idea is basically anytime your line is dirty and you're taking it out of your cache, you need to at least send it back so that 
um, you know, that's your way of basically handing off the latest data that you put in there, right? So if core one was just doing a load, what would have happened would be the same, which is I do a write back of um, location three now, uh, sorry, of the value three for address A, and now core one would read that and it would get three as its value, um, which is what it wants, not what was previously in my main memory. Wouldn't it be more efficient if you only do a write back when you're doing the load from an invalid state? Why do you need a write back if you're only doing well, you want to make sure that you don't have stale copies in your cache, right? So, I mean, we said that basically we have to have um, this global uh, vision of, uh, of all the loads and stores. And so, you know, we want to make sure that everything actually appears on the bus, even though, yes, in this particular case, it's going to then get overwritten. All right. <clears throat> so... One thing to note here is that um, is that in the case of MSI, you know, your cache can actually be responding as well as your main memory. Okay, so you have a little bit of a race condition, and you need to make sure that if both of them have different answers, that the one that's actually being listened to is the one from the cache. And typically, that's not so hard to implement because the caches are responding more quickly, um, but that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so finally, one last example uh, for this MSI protocol is now we want to do a final load, okay? And so we've got our uh, core one in the modified state, and we want core zero to now do a load, okay? So what's going to happen in this situation? In this situation, we can't have um, core zero do a load while core one is in the modified state. So we're going to issue a bus read request. Core one is going to see that bus read request, and it's going to say, okay, I need to get out of my modified state. And so the way that it does that is it issues a bus write back in order to write its value um, back and remove it from its cache. So it writes the 10 back to main memory. After it does that, it can go to the shared state, and now the core zero can also go to the shared state, and both of them will now have the same value, um, which is the most recent value which core one had previously written. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, great. <coughs> so, we can make a slight um, uh, uh, modification to MSI to make things a little bit better. If we, um, if we notice that we have many situations where even if I'm not sharing data, I'm going to be going through this read, modify, write sequence of events. And if you look back at your um, FSM for MSI, what happens when I need to do a read, modify, write? How many bus transactions am I gonna need? So I'll need one for my read and another one for the, for the write, okay? So basically, even if I'm working on my own private data that nobody else has in their cache, I'm actually causing two bus transactions, which are pretty costly. And so we can solve that by basically adding one more state, which is called the exclusive state. And so the idea here is that Instead of going into the shared state when you, do, um, when you do a read, if nobody else has a copy of that address, then you go into the exclusive state. <clears throat> and so by being in the exclusive state, you're basically giving yourself the opportunity to save one bus transaction when you do um, a write and you're the only person who actually is looking at that, who actually has that address in their cache. So, <clears throat> Here's the um, modified FSM for this uh, new four-state machine, which is, um, we call it uh, messy for uh, modified, exclusive, shared, um, invalid. And while it looks scary, it's pretty similar to what we had before. We're only adding a couple additional arrows plus this exclusive state. So essentially, the things that are changing now is if I'm in my invalid state, 
and I do a, I get a process read of a particular location, then if that, um, that read is shared, meaning other uh, caches have that address as well, then I go to my shared state. But if nobody else has that address, then instead I can go to this exclusive state, okay? Once I'm in my exclusive state, then reads I can just respond to uh, right away. But more importantly, if I then do a write, I can go from my exclusive to my modified by just issuing a processor write and not having any additional bus request. Okay? Any questions about that? All right, good. All right, so that's it for Snoopy-based caches. And, um, you know, as we add more and more parallel processors, the Snoopy-based caches uh, stop scaling, basically. It becomes too cost prohibitive to be sending, you know, these broadcast messages to every single one of our processors. And so as your systems get larger, what we use are directory-based um, uh, cache coherence. And so we're not going to get into the details of how this works, but basically the main idea is as follows, where um, you have a whole bunch of processors, each of them has their own cache, and you take your entire um, memory and you basically divide it up amongst all of those processors. And so each one of the processors is responsible for a portion of the memory. And in addition to being responsible for that portion of the memory, they also are responsible for maintaining this directory, which has all the information relevant to what's going on in that memory. Okay? And so in that directory, directory, anytime that some other processor is making a request for a particular address, it's going to keep track of it and it's going to know who has which copy, whether they're in the modified, shared, exclusive, or whatever state. And now, um, when it needs to uh, make uh, the caches, you know, change something about their state, instead of sending a broadcast that's on a big shared bus to everybody, it actually is going to send an individual message to the particular process that it's relevant for. And so we're reducing the amount of communication by moving to this model. Okay? And you can certainly read up more about it uh, uh, to get more detail. Now, just before um, wrapping things up, there's just one last thing that I wanted to mention, which is as we're dealing with these cache coherence issues, you're going to find that um, different situations, and we're going to look into one example here, um, can lead you to uh, bad performance in your cache unnecessarily. Okay, so let's take a look at what I mean by that through this example. So suppose that you have a cache line, you know, and until now, you know, in, in today's lecture, we were just talking about a cache line that has a single word in it, right? But when we studied caches, we saw, we learned that in reality, our caches are are generally blocks of multiple words. Okay, so imagine that my line actually has, you know, um, n plus one uh, words, and and now imagine that one cache, you know, is dealing with one word in my line, while another cache is dealing with another word in my line. Okay. Because these two words happen to live in the same um, line, anytime I want to do, one processor wants to write to uh, the location that it is trying to modify, let's say it's word I, and the other processor is trying to modify word K, even though they're not actually interfering with each other, in other words, they're not trying to, uh, to modify the same address at all, what's going to have to happen is that they need to get that entire line into the modify state. And so basically the first cache is going to, um, you know, request to modify that line, it's going to force the other one to invalidate itself, and then it's going to update, you know, word I. And and then the next one's going to come along and it's going to want to um, update word K and so it too is going to request the modify state, it's going to make the first processor invalidate itself so that it can update itself, even though there's actually no conflict between um, these two writes. So 
the the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, if we're not careful, there can be a lot of um, ping ponging amongst our um, different caches in terms of who is requesting the. The, the ability to write it and sometimes it's not actually for a real reason right so like in this example you could simply um, add uh, you could simply uh, move the where your words are located such that they don't end up in the same cache line and by doing that you would uh, you would avoid this ping ponging problem okay and just like it occurs here it occurs in other situations um, as well that so we want to always be careful to think about you know what do we need to do if there is a possibility of this ping-ponging which is going to uh, reduce the performance of our caches all right so that's it for today um, and as I mentioned, next time uh, is a fun lecture about putting it all together. In case we don't see you next time, then it's been a great semester. Thank you. And, um, and good luck finishing up all your work for tomorrow. And we'll see you also at the quiz. Thanks.